Well, for every single person who is a follower of Jesus, you have the same goal. And I know what it is. You want to know him more. You want to know his love and sense his presence. When you open the word, you want God to speak to you. You want to encounter the living God in a way that, that brings your heart alive. And if you're not yet a follower of Jesus, and every, every time we gather at Shoreline, there's, there's people that are with us online uh, here that are still trying to figure out the whole God-Jesus thing, but you're, you're curious and you're searching, and we're so glad you're here. You're completely welcome, and our arms are wide open. But if you're in that searching-seeking process, what I can tell you is this. When you come to that point, if you know who God is and you kind of come to faith in Jesus, there'll be this desire in you to know him more, to grow more in love with him and to walk more closely. That's the goal of every follower of Jesus. Here's the problem. Here's the issue. How do you do that? How do we follow Jesus and walk more closely with him? We're all different. We're all wired kind of differently. And for some people, they've never really been taught how to take that journey of faith. Or what happens for some people is they're taught this is how you do it, exactly like this. Here's how you encounter Jesus. You sing, you dance, you do cartwheels, you jump around, and you say, glory to Jesus. And some of you go, yay! And some people go, uh, not so much me. <laughs> so some people say, if that's the only way to come close to Jesus, then I guess I can't walk that pathway. Others might say, okay, you sit down, you open your Bible, you study, you dig in, and you, and you get your brain fully engaged, and you study, and that's how you meet with Jesus. And some people go, yeah! I love that. That feeds my soul. Other people are like, that doesn't do it for me. So, so the reality is we all want to walk close with God if we're Christians, if we come to faith. The problem is we haven't learned how to, or sometimes people say, this is the only way to do it, and we don't fit into that model. Here's the good news, and this is what we're talking about these, in this four-week series, that God has kind of answered that problem before it came. God says, there's many ways to encounter me, many ways to walk closely with me. Now, let me be absolutely clear. There's only one way to come to God Almighty and have your sins washed away. That's through faith in Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. There's one way to God. But when you know God through faith in Jesus Christ, there's many ways to walk with him and to fall in love with him and to walk more closely. And those ways are, are different because we are different. You try to imagine somebody saying, if somebody has you know, two or three kids, well, I'm going I'm to raise them all exactly the same, even if they don't like it. You're going to have problems. You, you guys you know, each person is, has their own temperament, their own wiring, the way that God has made them. So we should discover that and let that blossom. And it would be strange to think that, that God would do anything different. And so God hasn't. God has made lots of pathways, one way to him through faith in Jesus, but lots of ways to grow up in that faith. So last week we talked about the three pathways of wonder. There's some people that, that just kind of, they, they have this wondrous heart and they draw near to God in certain ways. So we talked about the naturalist. A naturalist is a person who, who when they're outdoors, they're in creation, when they see all that God has made, they don't worship the creation, but they worship the creator. And there's some people who just being in the outdoors and being in creation kind of propels them into the presence of God. Wonderful. If that's you, then, then utilize that pathway and come closer to God. There's some people that are called what we call sensates. We talked about this last week. A sensate is a person who uses their senses. They connect with God when they can touch things and they can smell things and hear things and see things. And, 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 just, and, and those, their senses being involved just sort of kind of ushers them into the presence of God. Wonderful. If, that, if that's what draws you near to God, then walk that pathway and discover ways to walk it more consistently and more, in ways that are more rich. And then there's also those people who... Uh, are, what, are what we call a traditionalist. They meet God through rhythm and repetition and remembering the past. There's some people that when they come to communion, it brings back a lifetime of memories. It just sort of brings it all alive for them. There's certain people that, that, that the, the ritual and the routine and the rhythm of, of worship kind of fits for them and draws them close to God. Great. Don't force somebody who's not like that into that mold. But if that's your way, Use that pathway to walk closer and closer with the living God. Well, this week, we're going to talk about three more pathways called the pathways of contemplation. I'm going to ask, oh, I think I might have one fisherman's friend right here in my pocket. There we go. Commercial for fisherman's friend. I love these. They're a great little, uh, when, my, when my, my throat gets dry and scratchy, it's wonderful. Uh, so uh, we're going to explore the pathways of contemplation. 
And, and, here's, and here's the idea of contemplation. For some people, you know, we, we live in this busy, hectic, driven world where it's just go, 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 busy, busy, busy. And even during this time of COVID, for many people, it's still been busy or more busy. For some of you, you're having to do everything you used to do online and in person, and your work has almost doubled. And so, so in a busy, hectic, driven world, there are people who, who meet with God when they slow down when it's quiet, when there's room for reflection, that then, then they connect with God. You might have even noticed today that Cole and the worship team planned songs today that were a little more contemplative. Do you notice what we didn't do after any of the songs today in this service? You know what we didn't do after any of the songs? Have you noticed? We didn't break into applause. When you have like a, like a hand clap and pray, sometimes when you go, woo! But there's also some songs we did some today that are just kind of more quiet and reflective. You might have noticed, and some, for some of you, this was wonderful, but for some of you, it was frustrating. The last song we did, it was kind of like a quiet moment. They're playing instruments, just kind of quiet, cold. So let's just think about what we're thankful for and God's presence. And for some of you, you were like, oh, this is so good. This is a quiet moment. You're praying and reflecting. Other of you are going, what's, what's wrong? Sing some words. Sing some songs. We're here to sing. And some of you were like, come on, get back on the... Some of you were feeling that, weren't you? Like, what's wrong? Why aren't we singing? That's because we're different. And they, they, today they planned a worship set that was just kind of more quiet, more reflective, more space for contemplation. Because some people meet with, some of you, it was like, this is one of my favorite worship sets ever because it was kind of quiet and reflective. That's wonderful. So we're going to walk through three different kind of pathways. And again, remember, it's not like this one's right and this one's wrong. What's right is that we would all go closer to God and connect with Him. So I'm going to share three new pathways, and hopefully some of you will say, man, that's for me. I noticed in the last service when I get a certain pathways, there some, some people I'm kind of watching, some people start going, oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah. One guy sitting, who was sitting right up here in the front said, during the sermon, you talked about one of the pathways that was so much my wife, she wasn't able to make it today. She said, he said, my phone vibrated in my pocket during that part of the sermon, and I knew it was my wife saying, that's me. <laughs> he, said, he said, I'm going to check. He said, I'll guarantee you. It was her going... I'm okay to be me. I'm okay to meet with God in a way that's more quiet and personal and reflective because that's how God's made me. One of the bonuses of this series, I hope, for all of us is to be able to bless the way other people are, but also to say, God, I thank you for how you've made me. And there's ways I can meet with you in intimacy and deeply. So we're going to walk through the three pathways of contemplation. And here's the first one, the pathway of the intellectual. The intellectual. Intellectuals say, let me think. They say, I meet with God when I can think about the things of God. And my mind goes deep into who God is and what he's done. This pathway is not about IQ. It's not about academics. It's about a kind of person who, when they learn a concept about God or kind of who God is in a fresh new way, that idea, that truth, that reality just goes right from their mind to their heart and draws them close to God. And there's some people that need that connection of really their mind dwelling on the things of Scripture and the things of God. When their mind is engaged, their souls soar in worship. So I was thinking about that and thinking about how, how Cole and the team will oftentimes bring new songs to us and teach us new songs. And so I was thinking about this song. I remember when, the first time we did the song Canvas and the Clay. And so this song, The Canvas and the Clay. And so you think about a new song. So we get a new song here at worship and you learn a new song. The enthusiast, the people who walk the enthusiast pathway that we'll look at next week, the enthusiast will say, oh, I love that song. It made me cry or it touched, it touched my heart and I just, and I just, I just was raising my hands and I just, had, and I just, and just like, yes, I just, it just, something about it just drew me close to God. Wonderful. Great. But the sensei, the person who kind of connects with God through their senses would say something like this. They say, I love that song, the music and the rhythm of how it fit together. And how Jeff played the bass. There was one song today that the bass, I thought the bass was, I told Jeff between services that the bass was so beautiful, just kind of helped my heart draw near to God. But they'll say, you know, that, that the music and how it fit together as I was listening to it, that drew me into God's presence. The intellectual person is going to go, oh, you know what struck me? The lyrics. The lyrics. So listen to, the, I mean, listen to these words. For the intellectual, it's, it's all of a sudden the message of the song will strike their mind and, and they'll... They're probably not singing that song through the week crying. They're thinking about the concept because that's what moved them close to God. So listen to these words, how the song begins. In my mother's womb, you formed me with your hands, known and loved by you before I took a breath. 
When I doubt it, Lord, remind me, I'm wonderfully made. You're an artist and a potter. I'm the canvas and the clay. This is my approach. <laughs> this is Adam. I, I did the survey tool that's on the website. I'll mention that more later. But I, and I was like, by far, this is my most natural pathway. There's other ways I connect with God, but this one draws me close to God. But it's, it's the words, it's the concepts, it's the lyrics. That's what strikes me because that's the way God's wired me. So, so here's the question. If the enthusiast, if their response is, is kind of wonder and glory and, and, and praise and it was kind of outward, outward expression, if the sensei is, I dr- drank it in and kind of felt this, the sound of the music and that's what drew me close to God, or the intellectual says it's the lyrics and the words and the ideas that drew me close to God, which of those three approaches is the right approach? What's the answer? All of them. And that's what we've got to do. We've got to bless people in the way they draw near to God. One way to Jesus, one way to the Father through Jesus Christ, but many ways to grow in our faith. And we've got to be able to find ways that really connect for us because our desire is to grow closer to God and to walk near Him. So this intellectual approach, it, it kind of touches the mind and then from the mind moves to our hearts. So let's learn from people on the path ahead of us, people that have that intellectual approach. And in each of these cases, we're going to look at three different biblical characters, one for each of the different pathways and learn from people, and then also modern people that, have, that walk this pathway. So, when you think about the intellectual approach, the first person that comes to my mind is Solomon. You know, Solomon wrote most of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, inspired by the Holy Spirit to write books of the Bible. But, but turn with me to Proverbs chapter 1. And in Proverbs chapter 1, this is where we find out that Solomon's the writer. And listen to these words. You're going to hear the words of a person who connects with God by the use of their mind. By, it, it's, that's, it's no less spiritual to learn to come near God with your mind than to come near with your emotions because we're holistic people. But listen to Solomon in Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. The proverb of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, for gaining wisdom and instruction, for understanding words of insight, for receiving instruction in prudent behavior, doing what is right and just and fair, for giving prudence to those who are simple, knowledge and discretion to the young. Let the wise learn and add to their learning. And let the discerning get guidance. Look at the words there. Instruction, understanding, knowledge, discretion, learning. Solomon came with this mind engaged with the things of God. That was a connection point for him. But I also noticed right in the middle of that passage, in verse, the end of verse 3, for doing what is right and just and fair. It's not just knowing the things of God, but we live it out. We do what is right and just and fair. Knowing the right things leads us to doing the right things. This is why James, in the book of James, says, don't be just a hearer of the word, do what it says. We learn, and then we live out of what we've learned. Who are people that have walked this pathway? Uh, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas, um, he, wrote a, he wrote something called the Summa Theologica, the Sum of Theology, this massive volume of kind of all Christian theology, a thinker who thought, used his mind for the Lord. He, he, this is one of his quotes. Prayer must include assent to the mind of God. So when we're praying, we're connecting with the very mind of God. He didn't say the heart of God. He said the mind, because that, that's how Aquinas thought. Uh, th- this, this is my pathway. I find that I don't feel connected with God the way I know I want to feel connected until I've learned a lesson, something from God's Word. That's just the way I... So, so if, in my journal, almost every day of the year, and I just highlighted a couple things in yellow, I went back the last three days. So this morning, <clears throat> before, I got, uh, before I kind of did my run through my sermon early this morning, before that, I sat with the Lord, and I, and I spent a little bit of time uh, in Psalm 116, and here's what I took away. God calls us to remember and fulfill our vows. He says, remember your vows and fulfill them to the Lord. That was the thing that hit me. So I not only prayed that for myself, I prayed that for family members and friends. That was the idea, the thought that kind of, has, kind of carried my heart this morning and launched me into my day. Yesterday, uh, I was in Psalm 115. And so I wrote this down. To seek only you, God, to reject all idols and experience your flourishing wonder and life because I walk with you. That was the thought that God put on my heart. And I can go back day by day by day. Each day, uh, the day before, it was really looking at the topic of water in Psalm 114 and how God divided the waters but also provided water and how God is the one who opens the way. And, and, and each day, is, I, I, I need a thought 
that touches my mind, that fills my heart, and that guides my life as I start my day, or I don't really feel like I'm walking close with Jesus. That's the way. I'm, now, some of you are like, man, that wouldn't work for me. That's okay. You don't need to be like me. I'm just telling you that, that this is an approach for some of you that go, man, this, this could really fit for me. Uh, Wayne Grudem, this is, a, this is a nice little book right here. Wayne Grudem, Systematic Theology. Over 300,000 copies of this have been sold, and it's, 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 it's rich theology. And some of you are like, I wouldn't want anything like that. That'd be a doorstop for me. And others are like, no, I'd love to read a book all about it. And, and, and Grudem is so theologically strong, but he also, in every section, he finishes with prayers and hymns and praise songs about that theme theologically. But this is somebody who's, who's got this intellectual approach. Uh, Lee, I wrote down Lee Strobel here too. You know, the case for Christ, the case for faith, uh, the case for the real Jesus, the case for the creator. The case, you know, this is Lee Strobel. Lee was a law, studied law and then worked at the Chicago Tribune as an editor and a writer in the legal area. And, he, and when his wife became a Christian, he went to prove that she was wrong and in trying to prove that Christianity was wrong intellectually, he met Jesus and became a Christian. So his pathway fits how God's made him. So I want to talk about walking with God on this pathway. If, you, if you're listening saying, that's not me, then just hang in with me for just a minute. But for those of you who said, that sounds like me, here's some ideas, some things that will help you along the way. Study the scriptures. Don't just read the Bible. Study the scriptures. And we have classes here. I see Barb right here. We've got, we've got precept around precept. You can learn that. We've got other classes that will teach you how to, how to dig in and really study God's word. And so go deeper into God's word. Memorize big chunks of scripture. If you have this approach, just commit, commit a paragraph or a, or, or a chapter of the Bible to memory and let it fill your mind and carry you forward. Here's kind of a fun idea. For, this will be fun for you if you have this approach. Spend a whole month studying one topic. So study the topic of grace for a whole month. Just go, on, go online and find a good Christian website and say, you know, Bible passages on the topic of grace. And study like the first uh, 150 pa- passages over the next 30 days and just dig into that topic. Or pick a book of the Bible like, you know, 1 John and spend 30 days just reading it every day, every day, and just kind of laying out what you're learning and what God's teaching you. Study a character like Elisha. We're going to do a series coming up pretty soon, right after this series actually, on Elijah and Elisha. Elijah and Elisha. Most of you would say, I've heard of those guys in the Bible, but if I told you who did which one, you go, I don't know which guy it was. I get those two confused, right? Uh, but we're going to look at Elijah and Elisha. Well, maybe you spend 30 days studying the life of Elisha and learning about him, if you have this approach. Um, and if you're doing that, find someone else who's interested and teach them what you're learning. One of the best things you can do when you're learning is share what you're learning with somebody else. And so that may, that may be good for you. Take a theological course. If, you're, if you have this approach, I would challenge you, write this down, Zondervan Academic Online Courses. And you can go back and watch this message again. Zondervan Academic Online Courses. You can get some of the best Bible professors in the world. A number of my professors that I paid like three, $4,000 for a course for, they have now online for like $59. And you can do the entire course. You, you can actually download it for and you have it for an entire year. And you can study that theology, church history. Some of you are like, why would I do that and pay for it? This is probably not for you. Uh, but some of you are like, I can get a $4,000 seminary course, seminary level course, and have it on my computer for a year for $59.99? Man, if that gets you excited, go check it out. Go deeper into the things of God. Engage your mind. How do you use your travel time? You know, if, if you're an enthusiast, put on praise music and sing praise to God. If you're an activist, when you're driving around, we'll look at them next week. Uh, look around the community. Where is there injustice? Where is there brokenness? How can you pray? How can you take action? You know, study and, and pray for revival in our community. Uh, if, you're, if you're intellectual, use that drive time to listen to podcasts and sermons and bring your mind, or listen to scripture, and bring your mind alive. Study a great character from, the, from, from history, Martin Luther, John Calvin, some character from the history of the church. Study Christian ethics, study apologetics. We do a class here called Tactics. There's another one coming up in March that Pastor Dennis is leading that's all about how do you develop your mind to be able to articulate and explain your faith. There's lots of ways to grow closer to God by engaging your mind. That's just some things to get, kind of get you thinking. But I'll tell you this, on every pathway... There's not only a great way forward to grow closer to God, but there are potholes and there are pitfalls and there's, and there's problems along the way if you're not careful. And, and when I looked in, in this book that Gary Thomas wrote, Sacred Pathways, and Sherry and I got to write the small group study guide with Gary for this book just this last year, which got me thinking, I want to share this with Shoreline Church because it's so rich and so powerful. Um, as, as we were uh, walking through that, um, Gary lays out three 
kind of potholes you have to watch out for if you have the intellectual approach. And I realized that I like smashed the rims on my, the car of my life dozens of times on each of these potholes. I mean, these are things that are real deals. So here's three potential potholes be careful of if you have this approach. People with an intellectual approach to their spiritual life can, become, can gravitate towards controversy, can like to argue with other people because they, they feel such conviction. And instead of being a thing that propels you closer to God, it becomes the thing that helps you fight with other people. I don't think that's what that's for. It's, there, it's really there to draw us close to God. A second, a second pothole is pride. Sometimes the more we study and learn, man, I know so much. I am just, I, I've just become so wise. And we can start to become arrogant and prideful about what we know. We're, God is not wanting us to exercise our mind and grow to become arrogant about ourselves. He wants us to do it, why? To glorify him. So we need to focus on that, right? And then also be careful about knowing without doing. We can just get in that habit of just knowing a lot of information, but not living it out the way God wants us to. So the intellectual approach, it's a wonderful approach. If that's you, let it propel you closer to the Lord. Watch out for the potholes, but keep growing in your faith. Here's the second pathway we're going to look at that's kind of under the contemplative umbrella. The pathway of the ascetic. Ascetics request, please, let me be alone. I meet with God in silence and solitude and simplicity. And the busyness and the noise of life just uh, makes it hard for me to focus on the Lord. So they, they kind of want to pull away and find quiet places. You can see how this could fit with the music we did today, kind of quiet, reflective space to think, not just jam full of stuff, but kind of room to breathe. So here's three words that would reflect the heart of an ascetic, if that's their pathway to grow. Solitude, simplicity, and silence. These are people that have almost a little bit of a monastic. They're kind of like a monk. They want to kind of pull away and have quiet spaces. And some of you are going... That's totally me. This was the one that about now, the guy sitting here's phone started buzzing and he knew his wife was going, oh, there's a pathway for me. It's okay, I'm the way I am. God can draw me near to, to himself. And, and they, I, I, I know she was just rejoicing, being able to go, that's, that's my way of growing closer to God, a primary way. And, and people like this, when they're alone, they don't feel alone. Why? Because they feel the presence of Jesus. And they have this intimacy that comes in the quiet places. And for these people, they're oftentimes countercultural, meaning they don't really fit into our culture because it, our culture is busy and hectic and jams in everything we can into every day. And these people say, if I'm going to walk with Jesus, whew, i got to step back and breathe sometimes. So for those people, they can, they can walk with Jesus out of who they are. So let's learn from people on this path ahead of us. And the, who, who's an example of an ascetic in the Bible? We'll turn to Matthew chapter 3. Matthew chapter 3. A guy named John the Baptist. John the Baptist was not subtle in sending out cues that he wanted to be alone. All right? He needed space. Listen to this passage, and I want you to notice how many different things are clues that John might have been looking for some space and needed, you know, meeting God in the quiet places. Matthew 3, beginning in verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness. There's a clue. People that hang out a lot in the wilderness are not looking for crowds. Now, people came to him, but he was in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel's hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist. His food was locusts and wild honey. Any clues that John's looking to have some space? Let's start with his diet. John, you want to come over for dinner? He wasn't, well, you know, can you do something uh, light on the lactose and, 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 and no gluten? And he, he was like, are you serving locusts? No, can't make it. <laughs> I mean, he, he had a pretty, pretty narrow dietary restrictions, right? I mean, he, 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 just the clothes he was wearing were kind of saying, give me some space, give me some room. He, he went out into the wilderness by his own choice. And his message, who likes to hang out with somebody who says this to them on a regular basis? basis. By the way, you need to repent. You need to repent. You need to repent. You need to repent. It's like, give me a little space, John. And so I, I, you look at John, and he had this, this and, and, he, and yet he loved God, but he created some space. Other biblical examples, uh, the Nazarites had certain guidelines for their lives. Jo John was actually under a Nazarite vow, but the Nazarites kind of had this kind of thing where they pulled away from the world a little bit. Jesus would often find quiet places to talk with the Father. There was crowds and people around him, but Jesus would look in the mornings. He'd go away to a quiet place. He, he'd, he'd go to, to, to the Garden of Gethsemane, not just at the end of his life, but through his life to find a quiet place. And Jesus loved the crowds. He loved the 12. He loved Peter, James, and John, the three that were close to him. But Jesus looked for time to be with the Father alone. 
And so this is kind of reflected in Jesus' heart and life. And then I was trying to think of a, a modern person that came to my mind, and who came to my mind was my son, Nate, my youngest son. Nate loves simplicity. He tries to get rid of clutter. He, he doesn't find Jesus and all the stimulus around him. He needs to kind of push that away and meet Jesus in kind of a quieter place. When he was a pastor on, on our staff here, he had an office. And if you walked into his office, people would be like, well, he never moved in. It was just simple. There wasn't lot, lots of pictures and, and it just so much so that a couple different times people went into his office and tried to decorate it for him. Sensates who go, you need to feel an experience and, and have something. And he, and he would just say, please don't do that. I like it this way. I like it stripped down, simple, no distractions. Why? Because that's part of how he's wired and he comes near to the Lord in that. We've got to honor people the way that God has made them. We have to honor ourselves in the way that God has made us. So, so people can walk this pathway. Here's some ways that you can walk on this pathway. Find and embrace solitude. Make space for quiet. Make space for solitude. It might be a 10-minute window where you turn your phone and your devices off. And by the way, if you don't know this, it's getting tricky now. To turn a phone off, there's a button. Sometimes you have to push this button and hold this button at the same time and then swipe Why? They don't want you to ever turn it off. It's got to be like, do this, this, this. I'll just leave it on. But you, know, you turn that off and you shut things down. You close the door and maybe just for 10 minutes. You try this sometime if this is you. You shut everything off, you close the door, and you go like this. <sighs> okay, I have 10 minutes just to be quiet. And you can meet with God in that space if he's made you like this and wired like this. Seek simplicity and minimalism. You know, a, sen a sensate, some of their senses, they want all kinds of th things around that stimulate their hearing and their seeing. But, but, but this kind of a person is somebody who's, just, who's simply going to say, you know what, I need, a, an aesthetic's going to say, I just need to not have all these these become a distraction instead of helping me. Uh, for a sensei, it helps them worship. For, for uh, an ascetic, it doesn't. It gets in the way and distracts them. Live with disciplines of making time in the rhythm of your day to simplify, to pull away, to be with Jesus. Um, do a night watch. What's a night watch? When everything's kind of, if, you, if you're raising little kids, when the kids are down, when everything's done, and you're kind of tired yourself, but just, just go somewhere quiet and like for an hour. When, when, and I said some of our military folks, we've got military folks here too, and then, you know, when you're kind of done with the day's work, everything's finished, find a quiet place at nighttime and just, just have maybe your Bible, read a couple of verses, a little notepad, and just be quiet and say, Lord, what do you want to say to me? And create space for that. Do a little silent retreat where you go away for an hour or two somewhere, just have a little retreat. Fast from food. And when you fast from food spiritually, you don't fast from food because of the food. You fast from food so that when that hunger rises up, you'll say, God, let me hunger for you more than I hunger for food. God, let me love you more. Let me seek you more. So try putting some things aside so you can turn your attention toward the Lord. I think of Brother Lawrence. This is a, this is a person, a believer, who he worked in a monastery years ago. He wrote a book called, uh, called, his book was called Practicing the Presence of God. Practicing the Presence of God. Little, little book. And he, his job in the monastery was to wash the dishes. So he washed hundreds of dishes every day. But with every dish, he would, try to, he would say, I want to wash this dish and dry this dish for the glory of God. I think about a parent who's doing laundry. And while you're doing laundry, and, and, and you may want to, you, know, you need to get through, you need to get it done, but what if when you're, okay, now I'm, I'm folding, you know, this, I've got a load of this one kid's clothes. And as you're doing it, you would just, as you're folding the shirt, you say, Lord Jesus, guard the heart of my child, my son or my daughter. And you make this a, a, a time of prayer. As you're folding the socks, Lord, guide their feet wherever they keep, protect them from going to places they shouldn't be going. And as you, as you fold the clothes, make it an exercise of kind of sacred, holy prayer while you're folding clothes. And that would change the whole, I mean, you still got to get through it, but what if in that time you're talking to God about each person whose clothes you're folding? That's the kind of thing that Brother Lawrence would do and that you could do if this is kind of a way that God has wired you. And then also just learn to unplug from all the distractions, from all the, you know, here, here's one of the challenges that most of you have. This is the challenge most of you have. You carry a powerful computer in your pocket. You do. My dad was, worked for Hughes and Lockheed and helped in the, kind of the creation of com universal computer graphics languages. I grew up around computers before there were computers in homes. And my dad would say, as he, you know, he would say you know, a few years ago, he'd say, you know, these, these phones that people have now, he'd say, this is more powerful than like a mainframe that took up two massive warehouses. This does more than these, mo these computers. I remember this thing at home with cards reading code. You know, I mean, it was just, but he'd say, this, this little phone has more power, computer power, than those entire mainframes. And you carry that in your pocket. And it's yelling at you constantly, pay attention to me, like this, respond with an emoji, you know, read this, think about this. 
And there's times you just got to shut it off, especially if you have this ascetic kind of a personality. Shut it down sometimes. It'll be painful at first, and then you're going to kind of go, I like this. Then you might actually walk somewhere and go somewhere and forget your phone. It could happen. That sounds like craziness, but it could happen. And, and then there's pitfalls also and potholes for this kind of an approach. If you have this pathway, it's great. Nurture it. Grow in it. But be careful that separation from people doesn't cut you off from shining the light of Jesus. Sometimes a person like this kind of pulls away from people, but you still have to engage. Why? Because Jesus says, every Christian, you're light in this world. So let your, pull, pull away at times, but then let God fill you up so you can re-engage and shine the light of Jesus wherever you go. But be careful you don't block people out. Also, be careful you don't get, get caught up in the focus on what you've set aside. Well, I'm fasting about this. I'm giving up this. I'm simplifying here. I'm, and all of a sudden, your focus is on all the things you're giving up. And the focus isn't what you give up. The focus is the one you get when you're not focusing on those things. Keep your attention not on what you're sacrificing, but on who you're walking with and who you love. And then also, what can happen for a person that has this sort of ascetic type pathway is you can start to think that God's love and favor, God's love for you and God's favor are based on what you've given up and what you've sacrificed. But they're not. God's love for you and God's favor are based on what Jesus gave up on the cross. There's nothing you're going to give up that can touch what Jesus already gave for you. So he loves you the way you are. But if you choose to set things aside to meet with him more, he'll delight in that because some people need that kind of approach to God. One more pathway of the contemplative, kind of under the contemplative umbrella, and that's the pathway of the contemplative. And so contemplatives ask, let me feel. They want to feel, but contemplatives aren't asking you to feel by their, their, their senses. They're saying, let me feel God in my heart. Let me, let me fall in love with God. Let me have this divine romance with the one who made me and loves me. Contemplatives have this heart that just loves God, and they feel the love of God back for them. And their pathway is contemplating the greatness of God's love and expressing their love back to God. Now remember, all the path, in all the pathways, we've got to know the Bible. In all the pathways, we're going to pray. All of, our, all of our markers of spiritual growth are there for all the pathways, but there's kind of ways that we connect with God. And contemplatives feel the love, the presence, the touch of God. They would say, God is my closest friend. They would say, God is my first love. It's almost like this sort of romantic heart connection with God that's just wonderful and beautiful. Not everyone has that, but some people do. So let's learn from some people who had that contemplative approach. A biblical example. Turn with me to Psalm 63. In Psalm 63, we meet David. This is one of David's psalms. And I'll read just some different verses from this. I want you to feel the heart of David. Now understand, when I read this psalm, these are the words of David, that David was a military leader. He was a king. He was a political and military leader. He was not a pushover. He was not, he, you know, he, he, but he still had a tender heart for God. And, and he had this deep love for God. So listen to these words of this, of this political military leader who passionately loved God. Psalm 63, beginning in verse 1. You, God, are my God. Earnestly I seek you. I thirst for you. My whole being longs for you in a dry and parched land where there is no water. Then look at verse 3. Because your love is better than life, my lips will glorify you. Look at verse 5. I will be fully satisfied as with the richest of foods. With singing lips, my mouth will praise you. You can hear his heart. Verse 6. On my bed, I remember you. I think of you through the watches of the night. I cling to you. Your right hand upholds me. You can feel his love and his passion. People who walk this pathway just feel the heartbeat of God and walk with him in intimate ways. The woman in the New Testament, the woman who takes this perfume, some say it was an entire year's worth of income, and breaks this jar and pours it out for Jesus. That's somebody who walks this pathway. They feel his intimacy. That's a contemplative heart. When I first became a Christian, a number of the other Christians I knew that were high school and college students, they said, oh, you've got to read this book. And they sure you had a copy. I had a copy. They said, it's called Come Away, My Beloved. It's, like a, it's poetry. It's like a love letter from God to us and us to God. And they're they like, oh, this is going to connect you to God. It's going it's to help you know him and love him. And so they, somebody gave me this book, and I started reading it, and I got about four or five pages, and I'm like, What? Guess who doesn't have this pathway as their primary way to Jesus? I was like, no, this didn't, this didn't work for me at all. But there are people like, this just propels me into the presence of Jesus because, because the, the author, Francis Roberts, had the contemplative approach and shares their approach. This is great. If you want to read this may connect for you. But it just didn't connect for me, and that's okay. 
I don't have to have every pathway. I just need to have some pathways to get closer and closer to God. And I thought of one person, a modern-day person, a woman named Lucille Patmos. Lucille has been a mentor in Sherry's life for years. And Sherry, when we're back in Michigan, almost every time she'll go visit with Lucille. She's 89 years old now. And she has said farewell to her husband, Jay, who she'll see in heaven someday. She said farewell to her daughter, who she'll see in heaven someday. She said farewell to one of her granddaughters, who she'll see in heaven someday. But she's walked through a lot of hard things in life. But when I think about Lucille, I've met few people. God, when I think about it, it touches my heart. I've met few people who with such purity and simplicity know the love of God in every moment and every breath they take. She, she, and when she's home alone, she's never alone because she's in the presence of Jesus and he loves her more than anyone. And if you walk this pathway, can, let, let God kind of spur you forward and grow you. So here's, here's some ways to walk on this pathway with joy and excitement and follow after God. Seek intimacy with Jesus. Make time for him. Uh, say his name. There's power. Just say, Jesus, I love you. Jesus, I love you. Lift up praise to him. Write a love letter to Jesus from you, to a love letter. Some of you are like, I asked Pastor Ben today. I said, Ben, would you feel comfortable writing a love letter to Jesus? He goes, nope. <laughs> That's not his approach. I, I knew the answer before. I knew the answer before he said it. But some of you are like, oh, I, I do that. That fits me. Great. It, 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 become, it becomes a written prayer. But if you write a letter, love letter to Jesus, don't post it on your Instagram feed and, and brag about it. It's, then it's not for Jesus. It's for show off, right? Just give it to Jesus and then tuck it away in your Bible, right? Write your own song of praise to him. Lift up a simple prayer that you could just make a prayer. I, I was thinking about a simple prayer to express love to God. I wrote down this prayer. I love you, I am loved by you, and my heart delights. I love you, I am loved by you, and my heart delights. I love you, I'm loved by you, and my heart delights. You say, well, that would get boring and repetition if I just prayed that prayer three or five or 20 times or whatever. Well, there's a, in, in the Bible, it talks about the song in heaven. It goes like this. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Verse two. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Verse three. Holy, 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 Lord God. And it goes on forever. And so a simple prayer brought from a loving heart to God can bring delight to the heart of God and can draw you into his presence. Uh, take a scripture like Psalm 150 and just make it your prayer. Take, pick a scripture of praise and make it your prayer of adoration to God. If you have this approach, make that space, make that time, reflect and be in his presence. And then there's some pitfalls and potholes also with this one. So I'll just give you a couple as we're winding down here. If you, if you have this kind of an approach and you just have this sort of loving, intimate relationship with God and this closeness, be careful of an imbalance that says, I'm all about being with God, but I don't encounter other people very much. Don't, don't, you know, let your intimacy with God propel you out into the world. Lucille Patmos, this woman I tell you about, she spends time with God every day. But when she's with other people, she's fully present. And it's almost like she just pours out the presence of the God she lives in front of, the God she walks with every moment. She doesn't withdraw from the world. She does to be with Jesus, but then she comes and passes on that goodness of God's grace to every person she encounters. Be careful of the pothole of forgetting that God is still sovereign Lord of the universe and the leader of your life. Sometimes people say, oh, I'm so in love with Jesus. I'm so close. He's, he's my closest friend. He's my dearest love. That's wonderful. And it gets my way. He's just my, he's like, you know, you got, you're wearing a t-shirt. You know, Jesus is my homeboy. Like he's my buddy and he's my pal. And I'm going to hang out with him. And, and that's great to be very familiar and in love with God. But you know what? He's still the Lord of the universe. And you got to remember that he's the sovereign God. And so have that intimacy, but also remember he is my friend, but he is glorious almighty God. And there's that balance of God's you know, presence and eminence, but also his transcendence and his glory. And we walk in all of that. And then one more kind of pothole you can watch out for if you have this approach to God, so you're walking this pathway, is you can kind of get addicted to the buzz of intimacy. I feel close with God. I feel his love. And you can kind of be addicted where it's just, I just want the next fix and the next fix of me feeling his love and feeling his love. But what it's supposed to be doing is bringing you into his presence to glorify him. It's not just about your feelings. It's about your relationship. Does that make sense? So don't just get caught up in the experience of it, but say, God, are you driving me more into your presence and more into you know, expressing your glory and living for you? And so we've walked now through six of the nine pathways. Next week, we're going to look at three more. These are the, the pathways of the activists next week, people who just are moved to action for the Lord. Some of you are going, yeah, when, when's, my, when's my pathway coming up? 
Be here next week for that, and we're going to look at three more pathways. But in the meantime, if you want to go deeper, and I hope you do, I hope that if you're at home in your cars, I hope you say, I want to go a little bit deeper into this topic. Um, read chapters 11, 6, and 10 of this book, Sacred Pathways. We've got copies of this book back here in the Connection Center, and we also have a link online where you can just click, and it'll, go, it'll get you to uh, pick, getting this book. And It's not free. You've got to pay for it, but uh, it's a great book. It'd be nice to have in your own personal library, though, so you may want to dig into that and read the book. Uh, and then also... We have a self-assessment that we created. We actually, uh, we took all the materials Gary had, we created a self-assessment off of his materials, sent it to Gary Thomas and said, is this okay? And he said, I love it. You guys can use it in your church. So it's just kind of designed for Shoreline. But if you go online and it's on the main page of our website right now, kind of in the center bottom, and it's say, take the self-assessment. And if you do it, you're going to get a feedback right away. This is all the nine pathways. And I'm super strong in, in one and super low in a couple other ones, but that's okay as long as you've got one you're strong in. Uh, and, and you can do that. And uh, if you check the box there that says you want to meet with somebody, that means you want somebody to talk with you through how you can kind of develop growth in that pathway. And we'll do that with anybody who wants to do it. And online, if you're visiting, you're out of, the, out of the state or out of the country and you want to do it, let us know online and we can have a virtual uh, video meeting with you and encourage you and your faith as well. And so we want to walk with people towards spiritual growth. Watch the podcast. I did a podcast with me and Gary Thomas talking about this topic. And we're going to do another podcast, I think, with Sherry and I and somebody talking about the, creating the resources for this book. Um, and then also on, the, on our app and on our website, there's lots of other resources. But, but here's the thing. I don't want you to, to walk out of the courtyard to kind of log off in just a minute or to drive out of the parking lot and say, oh, that was a nice sermon, and I learned some stuff about pathways. We want you to experience what you long for the most, to encounter the living God who loves you, to love him more, to know him more in a way that fits you, and there is a way. And so, Lord, this is our prayer, that we would walk with you, that we would discover that there's ways that you've made us that are unique and beautiful, and we can connect with you and love you and follow you and serve you and experience your presence in fresh new ways as we learn to walk with you in ways that fit how you've made us. So Lord, take the things we're learning today and last week and next week and then the final week, week four, we're kind of wrapping up and really propel us more into your presence to live for you, to glorify you, and to follow you. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. Before I send you off with a word of blessing, I want to give you a couple of important invitations. One is this Wednesday night at 6.15 right here in the courtyard and online and in the parking lot. We are going to have our night of worship. It is going to be an amazing night of worship. We're going to share communion together. We're going to have a bapt one or more baptisms right here in the courtyard. And it's going to be a great celebration. So we invite you to come at 6.15 online. Be sure you register. Just, I mean, not register. No, you who are going to be here, register. Online, just show up at 6.15 and we're going to worship the Lord together. If you need prayer for anything in your life, we've got a team right up here. There's Pastor Dennis and the team. Hi, team. Uh, under that banner that says need prayer, please don't leave the courtyard without sneaking up there and asking for prayer. If there's something going on in your life that's a need or a joy, share with them and let them pray with you. Online, you'll see the details right on the screen. Contact us and we'll pray for you. And then online, if you are new, we want to give you a personal welcome. So text the word welcome to the number you see on your screen and we will get a hold of you and answer any questions you have and give you a welcome. If you're on campus here, just go back to where the blue and uh, white balloons are to Patty there, and she has a little gift for you and wants to give you a personal welcome to Shoreline Church. Uh, we hope you're willing to do that and get to know us a little bit. To send you off, I want to invite you, if you're online or here in the courtyard and you're able to stand, will you stand with me as we send you off with a word of blessing? As you go from the parking lot, as you go from our online experience, as you go from the courtyard, may you walk with Jesus more intimately, more powerfully, more personally than you ever have before. May you discover the pathway God has made for you and walk it with boldness. And may you bless everyone else who loves Jesus as they walk in a way that fits who they are. And we all become more like the Savior. Amen? God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night, 6.15, and then next Sunday, continuing on in three more pathways. Have a great week.